keynote speaker on this conference. Dr. Amaro received her PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois. And uh, after that, she joined uh, uh, Dr. Andrew McMahon's lab at University of California, San Diego as a, as a postdoc. And she established her independent research lab in 2008. And today she's a distinguished professor in theoretical and computational chemistry at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at uh, uh, the University of California, San Diego. And in addition, she is the director of the National Computation Resource. Uh, she contributed to uh, way more than 100 uh, uh, scientific papers, and she received numerous awards. I'm going to mention only a few of those. She received uh, the NIA's New Innovator Award, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. She received several awards from uh, American Chemical Society, including the Open Eye Outstanding Junior Faculty Award, and most recently, uh, she received uh, the Gordon Bell Special Prize for COVID-19 for her COVID-19 research. Her uh, main uh, focus is uh, drug discovery by computational methods and biophysical uh, simulation. And today she's going to talk about her latest COVID-19 research and her, uh, the title of her talk is Computational Microscopy of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Dr. Amaro, welcome and the stage is yours. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Thanks for that. I'm really excited to be here today to speak with all of you. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And let's see if we can get this right. Do you see the correct, do you see the actual slides or do you see presentation mode? Could you swap displays, please? You bet. How's that? Looks great. Okay. Well, then I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for that kind introduction. And yes, as I mentioned, I'm really excited to be here today to tell you all about uh, what we've been doing to use computational techniques, in particular, one type of computational technique that I like to think of as computational microscopy um, for SARS-CoV-2. And I guess I just want to mention at the beginning, um, you know, so the, 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 I'm going to really focus on our work um, with uh, this virus, but um, I do also just want to hopefully uh, encourage people to keep in mind, you know, for those of you working on all sorts of different targets, um, that these types of methods uh, are really broadly applicable now. And so, um, just something to keep in mind, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end on that topic, but let's get started. Okay, so some of you may have already seen um, our work or, or heard about it. Uh, it's um, in, in October, actually, there was a really beautiful piece written by Carl Zimmer that was featured in the New York Times, which uh, sort of showcased our all atom virus model and simulations. And you can see the picture of that in the middle. And um, you know it was really beautiful to see it uh, in sort of in, in that uh, in that way, and of course also in in the printed version, it was like this beautiful centerfold, and it, it highlighted not only our work but the work of so many researchers, in particular structural biologists and computational biologists who have been working very hard to understand what the virus looks like in great detail and to try to understand the inner workings of the molecular piece parts, and so that's really what I'm going to focus on today, or sort of. Um, to sort of go beyond the images that you may have seen and actually tell you sort of the scientific story behind them. So I like to think, so in my group, I'm a computational and theoretical biophysical chemist. So I don't do, we don't do anything in the wet lab. Um, we have a number of really fantastic collaborations. I'll tell you about some of those today, but we do everything in silico. And I like to think of the techniques that we use, mainly molecular dynamic simulations, as a computational microscope. And because that, that really is sort of how we aim to use it. So nowadays what we can do is we can bring together a num all different types of experimental data sets. So these could be various types of structural data. So cryo-electron microscopy, X-ray crystallography and tomography data. We can combine those together with uh, glycomics or lipid and lipidomics or, or genomics. And we can build these highly detailed three-dimensional physical models of complex biological systems. 
And then what we're doing is we're approximating that system down to its many atoms. And you can see these atoms sort of wiggling here. I'm going to tell you more about that. But then all we do is we define, um, we use, we basically numerically encode this system and we define a relatively straightforward potential function, we call it, which basically just describes the interactions that the, all the atoms are having with the other atoms in the system. So how the atoms are interacting. And then all we're doing is integrating Newton's equation of motion over time. And we, so we start with some particular configuration Typically, this is specified predominantly by the experimental data. And then we integrate a small time step. And here I need to mention that this integration step that we're doing, the time step is one or two femtoseconds, which is very short for biology. But the power here is that now with these huge computers and thanks to advances in graphical processing units or GPUs, we can perform this integration millions and billions, and trillions of times to build up a dynamical understanding or trajectory of how these systems actually move uh, in time. And so, uh, so I like to think of these approaches, not only are they useful because they allow us to build a cohesive model from many different types of data, but because we can look at then subsequently sort of the fine grained dynamics, we can really extend our understanding of these systems in ways that are currently inaccessible directly by direct experimentation. So I think they're quite powerful and I'm gonna to try to hopefully convince you of that in the story that I'm gonna tell on SARS-CoV-2. So uh, it was just a little over a year ago um, and in fact, um, when you all invited me the first time to give this talk, which was supposed to be last year at around this time, I had planned to speak about our work with influenza. And so for, uh, for about six or seven years, um, my group has been working very hard to, to study the influenza viral glycoproteins and actually to do that in a way that fully appreciated their biological complexity. And so we were able to build and simulate um, essentially an influenza virus or the outer envelope of the influenza virus, which is shown here. And you know, in mid-February, it was finally published after, you know, like I was mentioning about six or seven years, because we had to build a number of tools in order to enable simulation at this scale. This had been at the time, one of the largest simulations ever uh, achieved. And it had about 160 million atoms uh, all told. But it was, so we were very excited about this. And it was about that time actually in mid-February where things were really starting to change with COVID-19. And so what I'm showing here are the total confirmed COVID-19 cases on a, log, on a log scale for the early months of the pandemic. And if you look at, by different countries, and you can see, you all probably remember that in mid-February, you know, the, 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 the known cases in the United States were still very low. But we knew that the virus had already escaped mainland, mainland China. And in fact, it was looking very grim in the Lombardy region of Italy. And so this was really when we started to you know, uh, pay more attention to what was happening with COVID-19 and seriously start to think about you know, um, starting to pivot some of our efforts. And it was, again, right that same week, um, uh, right the day after Valentine's Day last year, that Jason McClellan, together with collaborators at the National Institutes of Health, uh, deposited into the bioarchive the first cryoelectron, so near atomic structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And this was real game changer uh, for many of us. And you know, there's uh, so many important scientific aspects about the work of Jason and this, this group in terms of the 2P mutations and so forth that have now gone on to be part of the vaccines. Um, but this was really when we pivoted our efforts uh, really seriously towards SARS-CoV-2. And it's been, you know, it's been just a little over a year and I would still say we're, we're, we're still working at pretty frantic pace to try to um, you know, really understand this system in, in all of its detail. But so by now, most of you, I'm sure everyone listening is uh, really intimately familiar with the virus. This is an image of the virus that was created by my group. This is an atomic level representation of it. And we know now, I mean, it's a lipid enveloped virus. It, um, it, is, it looks sort of like a golf ball with spikes sticking out of it. And in fact, we call these spike protein, we call these actually spike proteins as, as many of you are, I'm sure aware. 
Um, and why we're so concerned about these proteins is because they sit on the outside of the virus and are essentially the first point of contact that the virus has with human cells. So they are very, very important in terms of you know controlling infection and, and, and initiating infection. On top of that, um, so there's you know obviously there's lots of interest in terms of understanding how these proteins actually work. What are their mechanics in the infection process? Of course, they're also part of uh, pretty much every uh, clinically approved vaccine. And so um, they're highly antigenic molecules also. And of course, so there's uh, immense therapeutic interest and utility in, in, in them. So um, what we were primarily focused on uh, We've, we've been primarily focused on understanding the initial infection process. And so one of the, the real key steps that has to happen is that the spike protein, which I'm showing here on the left and sort of grayish white surface, uh, has to interact with the receptor on the human host cell, which is um, ACE2, we call it, or angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And you can see that here in yellow, also here in yellow. Now the blue, the dark blue bits, I'm gonna to talk to you extensively about. These are glycans, and we're gonna talk a lot about these glycans. Um, another uh, sort of uh, part of the structure that I wanna bring your attention to is this light blue bit in the middle. This light blue bit is called the receptor binding domain or the RBD. And we're gonna keep coming back to that because this part of the spike protein is the bit that really makes that contact with ACE2. And that's this really critical handshake that has to happen in order for the infection process to occur. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we, uh, we, well, we, when we, when we, you know, when we were first thinking about how to sort of enter into this or where, where we, you know, where we should go with this work, you know, initially having just come off of the work with influenza, I have to say that we, um, we had aimed to try to replicate that work and also to, to build a full model of the virus for SARS-CoV-2. But, you know, one doesn't just sort of start by building this whole huge a system and then simulating it. I mean, the, our, our approach has always been a bit more reductionist in that one focuses on the different important piece parts first, make sure that each of those models is experimentally validated and of highest quality possible, and then bring those piece parts together into the working whole. So we focused, of course, on this uh, spike protein in part because also the beautiful data sets that had been made available by Jason and collaborators. I'm showing that here. This is this uh, prefusion state of the uh, spike protein. You can see, um, so the spike protein, uh, as we're gonna see, it's a trimer and each protomer is actually quite big, uh, you know, quite, quite, quite long. It's about 1300 residues, each of those. Um, and it has a number of different domains, which we'll, you know, we'll talk about. Um, but their initial structure had the receptor binding domain that I just mentioned in the, in the previous slide um, in what they call the up confirmation, okay? And this is a, um, you know, there's, there's so much interesting things to say here about this. We'll get to that. And also in the Q&A, I would guess. Um, but so this structure became available. And this was really, really critical, of course, to the study of and our understanding of this virus. A few weeks later, another fantastic structural biology group, the group of David Wiesler at the University of Washington, published another study that uh, disclosed another set of, of coordinates describing the upstate of that uh, RBD in the spike ectodomain. And it, they also use symmetry to create a model of the closed or all down states of the RBD. And so we took those structures and started to work with them. And something that um, you know, I need to mention, so these structures, as, you know, and, and cryoEM in general, you know, is really obviously um, has been a, it is, continues to be, will continue to be a really fantastic tool for structural biology and for, for science. Um, but, you know, no method is really perfect, at least not yet. And so, you know, these, these methods, as powerful as they are, uh, they can't, they still have trouble visualizing to atomic resolution bits of these proteins that are highly flexible. And so in these initial models, there were quite a few missing loops. Um, so these are, you know, dynamical regions generally on the edges of the structure that they were unable to resolve. Um, and there were other missing things too that I'll get to. But so we use computational methods to build those loops back in. We also, you know, oftentimes, um, famously in the case of the, of the spike, 
um, you know, experimentalists will need to introduce mutations in order to uh, increase or improve the expression of these molecules or to trap it in particular states. So the SARS-CoV-2 spike, of course, has this uh, 2P mutation, which probably everyone at the NIH already, you know, is well appreciative of. But this was a, turns out to be extremely important, not only for expression and for stabilization of the prefusion spike in the one up confirmation, but that also had tremendous implication for neutralization titers um, for, and I won't go into those details, but so we reverted these mutations back to wild type actually in our, at least in these simulations I'll tell you about, as well as some other mutations that were made to improve expression. Okay, and so this is, this is what our sort of built models look like at the end. They essentially look the same, but they're actually complete in terms of having complete fidelity to the, uh, to the protein sequence. So beyond that, so the spike head, so the full spike, as I mentioned, um, you know, is about 1300 residues. The spike head, which we call it shown here is what they were able to resolve with cryo-electron microscopy. Um, uh, we took that, but we also wanted to model the full protein. So we created, so these bits here, we created models using homology modeling of the stalk, which is basically a coil-coil helical bundle and then also of the cytoplasmic tail or the sort of intravirian domain. So this little bit that sticks inside the viral membrane. We created that in order to build a complete full length structure of the spike protein. Um, and so, you know, so we're mixing now experimentally resolved uh, data together with predicted data. The other thing that the cryo-electron microscopists and structural biologists in general have trouble seeing at atomic resolution because of their incredible flexibility are glycans. And yet this is a really important uh, component of viral proteins. And it's also a place where computing has a lot to give because what we can do is rebuild these glycans at the atomic level by obeying sort of the molecular recipes of, the, um, of these different uh, glycan constructs that were determined with glycomics approaches, such as um, this, this beautiful work by Max Crispin, also together with Jason, um, I think it was in, in, in March or maybe April, they published um, the site-specific glycan profile of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And this was really important information because it told us at each of the positions where there was a, a glycan present, what the molecular composition would be. And so just, um, I, I probably should have mentioned this before I got into that level of detail, but you know, glycans in general are a really important post-translational modification. They affect folding and signaling and all sorts of things, but for, for viruses in particular, they play an important role. They've long been believed and are known, in fact, to um, that viruses actually will sort of uh, create a glycan shield, they like to call it. And they call it a shield because they basically decorate their, their uh, their proteins, especially the, the envelope proteins on the outside of the virus, they are known to, they've basically evolved this way of hiding from the human immune system by decorating their proteins in the same types of sugars that our own host cell proteins have. And so, um, so um, again, in order to really sort of best appreciate what these glycans were doing and actually see what they look like, we were able to rebuild them according to the experimental data. Okay, and just to give a little bit um, more sort of depth to what that really means, because um, while most people are really familiar with proteins, you know, in general, glycans have been a little bit more towards the neglected side, I would say, um, in terms of study. I think that's really changing now, and I'm very happy to see it. But so for each of the protomers of the spike, there are 22 N-linked glycans. So these glycans, as I mentioned, it's a post-translational modification. They get added to particular the sequences. They call it a sequon. And there's 22 of these for each protomer that are attached to asparagines. And there's two O-linked glycans. So, um, and then you can imagine there's actually, there's actually three, you know, there's three chains. So at each of these sites, this is what it looks like. So for example, at N17, it's an FA2 type glycan. This is an example of what that looks like. These are different types of sugars with different types of linkages. And so in addition to, I would say rather complex, all the complexities of the protein, it was you know this painstaking work of at these particular positions, building out these molecular, you know, atomically detailed structures. 
And we did that. This was the really the you know the the painstaking work of uh, folks in my group, um, Lorenzo Casalino and Ziad Gayeb mainly, um, who worked very hard to make sure that this was faithfully reproduced. And so this is for chain A and chain B and chain C. And then, you know, so beyond the glycans, the other thing that we wanted to do, we also, we wanted to simulate the full length structure in a viral membrane. And so um, we know that this virus buds uh, off of the endoplasmic reticulum in the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. And thanks to many years of fundamental biology, we know the relative proportion of different lipid types um, in these different membranes of, of cells, right? So we, built in silico a faithful representation of these uh, of these membranes. So this is what the, um, so these are the different sort of lipid definitions, also cholesterol, and their sort of stoichiometric proportions that we have in our virtual membrane. And so this is what that membrane looks like. Right now we're focused down looking at the bottom of the spike. Okay, so this is the viral membrane sort of running across the middle of your screen. And it's different, All like you can see the different lipid types here, we've depicted them by different colors. So in pink and fuchsia and orange and yellow, these are the different lipid types and they're all, they're, they're all intermixed together. You can see here the transmembrane part of the spike in gray, these gray helices. And then there's one more bit I wanna draw your attention to. And that's in that cytoplasmic tail, it has a number of cysteine residues and yet another type of post-translational modification where those cysteines are palmitylated. And so this, um, you can see here in the yellow, that's the sulfur. And then this, these little bits that look like, they almost look like caterpillars. They're basically sort of snorkeling up into the membrane. And these are, um, these are sort of uh, commonly found in viral membrane proteins as a way to anchor these membrane, pro these viral uh, proteins basically into the, into the viral membrane. So our model also has that. And so this is what the full length model looks like. It's a movie just walking through the structure. So we have all of the domains that I told you about, including you know, cryo-electron microscopy resolved as well as homology model. We, we simulated different states. So we have the RBD in the up state as well as that closed state from um, the Wiesler lab that I told you about. We have all of the all of the N and O link glycans added the full length of the structure. We have the complexity of the viral membrane and the palmitylated cysteines. And this is what our full length structure looks like at the end of the day. So these are all the atoms, the viral membrane, the structure. And then what we do, as I was telling you about in that second slide, we are basically bringing it to life. We're animating this system. Um, but uh, through these molecular dynamic simulations. And so here, what this allows us to do is see this fine grain wiggling and jiggling of the atoms um, as they would sort of, this is how we predict that these atoms actually move at physiological temperatures and with all of their crowded environment you know, around them. Uh, we also have water here and we have sort of a buffer solution with ions and so forth, but I don't show you that because otherwise you can't see the spike. But there's an important point I want to make here that I just have to mention. Uh, you know, this is more than just a pretty picture and it's more than just like, it's not a video game per se. These simulations, as I mentioned, these, these numeric, molecular dynamic simulations are basically numerical statistical mechanics. And so what that means is that, and the reason why we pay so much in terms of the computing and we're willing to pay the high computational price for these is because when you, they, it's underlying these motions are really sort of rigorous theoretical frameworks. And so what this allows us to do at the end of the day is to take averaged microscopic properties that are computed by all of the atomic positions that you see here and connect them back to experimentally observable or testable macroscopic observables. So what does that mean? That means that we can take information from these simulations and we can connect them back to free energies of binding or heat capacity or uh, mutational studies. And so, um, and dynamics, for example, rates of motion. So, um, so it's, it's just an important point that I wanna mention, you know, sort of emphasize and underscore that the value of these is that um, I think now, and hopefully what this work as I'm gonna tell you about really shows is that when you combine these simulations 
together in hand with experiment is quite a powerful approach for understanding things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to have predicted based on the set of experiments necessarily that we have access to. So just, um, just to mention too, th these systems are on the larger side uh, of what you typically see. They have about 1.7 million atoms all told. And I have to really thank the TAC Frontera at the computing system for the really generous time so that they gave us to run these uh, computations. And we were able to generate about four microseconds of uh, sort of simulation for each system. Okay, so what did we learn? Well, one of the most exciting things that was really sort of obvious coming out of it um, was that we showed the world what the glycan shield actually looked like and so for the full spike. And so on the left is the spike protein, the end-to-end -end spike protein. This is the viral membrane in the bottom, the proteins in light blue. This is essentially what the structural biologists see. They see the protein predominantly. On the right is this same protein, but actually if it's actually the picture of, I think, what it actually looks like when one considers the glycans that are there. So the dark blue fuzz that you see, it looks like fuzz. These are the glycans. And so each here, each puff ball that you see represents essentially what I like to call a composite image. It's, it's, it's like multiple snapshots of a single glycan and all of the positions that it samples over one microsecond of dynamics. And so what you see so clearly here is sort of the, the volume of space that is swept out by these glycans. And this is what creates that very effective shield or mask from the human immune system. You know, because this, you know, the, it's basically hiding, you know, this foreign agent, you know, inside the body. And so, you know, people are interested not only in where the glycans are, but of course, where they're not, because we consider those places where there aren't glycans to be, uh, you know, particularly vulnerable, vulnerable parts of the spike or sort of chinks in the armor, if you will. So um, this was really, you know, I think exciting for a lot of us to see. The other thing that jumped out at us, simulations showed very clearly why the spike had an up confirmation and a down confirmation or why it opened and closed. And I'll show you. So we saw, one of the things that we saw right away was when we looked at the closed spike, this is looking down from the top. So as if you're ACE2, and this is looking from the side, you can see how covered and how well shielded this protein really is. From the side, you barely see anything. From the top, you can see a small bit, but it's mostly shielded in the closed state. In the open spike, you can see um, a to you, what you see sort of very clearly is how the receptor binding domain or that RBD is sticking up above that shield, right? And so this is from the top and from the side. And so, um, I mean, to, to I think to all of us seeing this, this was really remarkable. And I, you know, I I, I should ask uh, the structural biologists what they think, but I sort of always suspected that had the structural biologists, you know, been able to see the glycans in their uh, in their data, they wouldn't have just called it up and down, but they would have called it they would have called it shielded and exposed, or defending and sort of attacking. Um, so, you know, this. This is just like it, it was. Uh, it was you know sort of interesting for I think for people to see this. So the other thing is of course that these data sets um, are which we have made openly available for the universe to uh, to continue to analyze because they really contain so so much data. They contain just tons of data for analysis. So one of the things that we did was we looked at the accessible surface area of the spike protein according to different probe radii. And so the reason why we changed the probe radii is because if if one if if you're thinking about um, you know we're trying to sort of characterize uh, what is the access accessibility of particular regions of the spike, and um, you know if 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 the molecule that you're trying to bind is an antibody with sort of a larger footprint, they will have that will have a larger probe radius versus a small molecule you know would have a smaller probe radius, and so um, this basically showed us. Uh, that the head, so this is the analysis for the head portion of the spike, that it was in fact largely shielded. I mean, there, it wasn't completely shielded by glycans, but it was largely shielded. These percentages are basically averages of the shielding over the microsecond of dynamics. And we did that same analysis also for the stalk. 
and you can see actually how, and I mean, you can visually see it here, but then these numbers sort of back that up quantitatively. You can see how well shielded the stock is, especially for binding of, of larger molecules, which is interesting because um, I'm sure it's probably some of you there may know, the stock is actually one of the most conserved regions across the beta coronavirus family. And so, you know, it could represent a place where broadly neutralizing vaccines, you know, might, uh, or antibodies might um, uh, be a place to target, but uh, it, you know, there one should probably also consider uh, competing effects from the glycans, or it may sort of diminish a bit the um, the availability of binding to those regions. Of course, the other thing that we can do with these simulations is really analyze well, where are all these neutralizing antibodies binding, and you know, how how do the glycans actually change their footprint, or how do they work around the complexity of the glycans, and so. We know now that like, you know, many neutralizing. So this is an older picture, I have to say. This is, we probably generated this now in like July of 2020, where we had a handful of neutralizing antibodies. Now there are so many structures of neutralizing antibodies. I haven't gone back and revised this image, um, at least not for this presentation. But so we know now that it is, a, the spike is of course highly immunogenic and new, tons of neutralizing antibodies do bind on that exposed RBD. And those were among the first that they actually structurally characterized. So there's a whole bunch of receptor binding domain or receptor binding antibodies, B38, 47D11. There was a curious one by Ian Wilson at Scripps, what they called a cryptic and a, a cryptic epitope because actually it, it appeared to be a new, um, an antibody that was binding to sort of like the underside that would, would only be accessible actually in a two-up conformation, which was curious. But now we also, so there's the, all the receptor binding domain antibodies, but now we also know that the N-terminal domain is, is, is also super antigenic. And so um, at the time we only had 488. And you can see here the footprint of where that is binding. It's very close to um, the glycans. And in fact, uh, it's right there with the glycans may even be partially glycan recognizing. Um, uh, but let's see what else. There's another uh, uh, neutralizing. Uh, so the other thing I just want to sort of mention here, all of our simulations initially were just focused on looking at the prefusion confirmation in the RBD up and the RBD down states. But one, you know, and I don't have an image of this, so I don't do it justice, but you know, these spike proteins are incredibly interesting um, spring loaded molecular machines that facilitate that process of host cell fusion. And during that process, they start as prefusion, but then they lose the S1 domains and they, they undergo this incredible tr conformational transition um, and so there are, um, so we don't study that at all. This work that I'm telling you about is really focused on that prefusion state. And just a reminder of that is looking at where this 1A9 antibody binds. So there is an antibody known to bind in the connecting domain, which is um, this bit of the spike uh, protein that's like right where the head meets the stalk. And it's clear that that antibody was, was um, recognizing a different structure outside of the prefusion state because in the prefusion state, that's essentially completely occluded. Okay, so beyond the shielding, the other really interesting thing, and frankly, I think it's even, I think it's the most interesting part of what we've learned is that um, we seemed, we have found a function of glycans that goes beyond shielding. And so when we were looking at this system, one thing that we noticed was when we were looking at the closed state, there was one particular glycan at position 234, which I'm showing here in blue and green balls, that was always sticking sort of outward in solution, sort of like tangent to the circle. But when we looked at the open structure or that one up structure, what we saw is that two glycans were doing the same thing as in the closed state, sticking out into solution but one of them actually curiously was sticking inwards. And we, oh, and I have to say, this was a fantastic collaboration with Elisa Fada at Maynooth University. She's like a really, really terrific uh, glycochemist slash glycobiologist who has been just a wonderful collaborator. And we looked with her together at this and what we saw, so here's another picture of what we saw. So here we're looking at the spike head and I'm showing um, the different um, trimers or protomers in red and gray. And this is the up, the RBD up in blue. 
what we saw was that there were two glycans that when we rebuilt their glycan chain, we, they basically, those two chains filled up the void space that was created when that RBD went to the up state. And so I want to remind folks again, so uh, the surface is what the surface, so in, in red and gray and blue is what they saw in cryo-EM. The dark blue also, they do see with cryo, they did see in these structures with cryo-EM. So they can resolve the first couple of, the first sugar unit, in this case, a glicknac. I'm showing that in dark blue. What they cannot resolve or what they were unable to resolve were the, the rest of these complex, very flexible branch sugars. I'm showing those in green. So when we saw this, gosh, it looked to us like those, those guys were really holding up the RBD. So we decided to see what would happen if we made point mutations. If we mutated these asparagines to alanines, those glycans couldn't be added. If those glycans weren't there, our hypothesis was that this receptor binding domain would basically collapse downward and, um, and it would uh, reduce the ability of the spike to infect the cell or another, to, um, to interact with ACE2. So we created the in silico mutation, ran four microseconds of dynamics. I'm not going to show you the detailed data because I'm probably going too slow and I want to talk about some other things, um, some other newer studies. Um, but uh, we did see sort of that collapse in the dynamics. And when we saw that, then I decided to go out on a limb and contact Jason McClellan, who I'd never worked with before. I had followed his work with um, the other viral spike proteins earlier. Um, but uh, I didn't know him. Anyway, emailed him and said, hey, we have this hypothesis. I guess you're probably busy. I thought he would be very busy sort of doing vaccine stuff. But, you know, I guess once you sign the IPs, then he's just, you know, back to his sort of normal science life for the most part. Um, and anyway, so they were very kind. And he said, yeah, that sounds interesting. Let's test it. So what they did was he created, he and his group, uh, Jory and Christy, they created um, a bilayer interferometry experiment where they immobilize the, the trimeric spike protein on a surface and then they flow the ACE2 over it and they can sort of see the response which basically characterizes the interaction of the spike with ACE2. And so here we have our positive control which in his case is the 2P spike. I will say our simulations as I mentioned we mutated the 2P spike back to wild type because we were interested in sort of like the wild type dynamics. Um, but, and then as his negative control, this is gray line here, it's this engineered spike that has an extra disulfide bridge, which basically locks the spike into the down conformation. So that one ne basically never interacts with ACE2. And in the intermediate plots here, what you see are these two different constructs, the N165A and 234A, which they mutated experimentally. And you can see how the interac interaction with ACE2 is basically reduced. They couldn't get um, the double mutation to express very well, so we don't have that data. But that was great. So that largely substantiated our uh, hypotheses. And so what together, the experiment and collaboration uh, and, and computational work together basically not only showed the, 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 you know, the, the nice shielding and so forth, but actually established for the first time ever, not just for the spike, but I didn't realize this, this was for, for any viral protein um, or protein the that it sh we showed that the glycans were actually participating in the infection mechanism themselves. So not only were they the shield, but they actually, at times, act as part of the viral weaponry, essentially locking and loading this spike in the up conformation so that it's poised for infection. And this work was published in ACS Central Science, which I have to say is a fantastic journal uh, uh, in October of last year. Okay, but then beyond that, you know, this is sort of just like the, the first studies and beyond that, you know, as I mentioned, we were really sort of focused initially because that's where the, that's where the methodological uh, capabilities were. We were focused on just looking at sort of this, the baseline dynamics around these particular states. So the up confirmation and the down. But you know, ideally, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we would like to study that whole opening transition from the close to the open and really understand how is that process working and how does it change with different mutations and so forth. But the problem for us is that with simulation, as I mentioned, our time steps are very slow. They're one femtosecond or two femtoseconds. And that opening process, we now know from front experiments, appears to be basically sort of on the seconds time scale. 
So it's like way beyond computational capabilities if one is just using sort of what we call brute force or vanilla molecular dynamics. So we partnered with um, Lillian Chong at the University of Pittsburgh, who's been working for some years to develop a different kind of method. We call it an enhanced sampling method. And I don't want to make this into a methods talk, but I just want to say that there's a lot of really good people who are working to try to extend these methods such that we can actually capture with atomic resolution these, you know, interesting biological movements. And so in this case, um, you know, we're really interested in spike opening. And so the way that her method does that is it essentially reduces these waiting times or these sort of times that the system spends in the well. And it sort of enriches the ability of the system to go sort of up over these interesting sort of functional barriers in the energy landscape. So let me, to put this in to put this another way. So we used her Westpa, it's called Westpa, it's her software for um, she's in Pen Western Pennsylvania um, at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so oops. Wait, before we go there, I just want to say one thing that's important. So if we wanted to, to put this in another way, if we wanted to actually use standard molecular dynamics to sample that opening transition, okay, so standard MD, and we wanted to get one pathway, it would take us roughly 805 years now that we know that this is on the seconds time scale. This is that very nice FRET study that was, that was published. Using her enhanced method called weighted ensemble MD, in 23 days on this very beautiful uh, GPU computer at Texas called Longhorn, which they gave us generous access to, it took us only 20, it, we were able to get 300 independent pathways. Okay, so this is an enormous speed up. So what did we learn? Well, first let me show you, oh no, the movie's not gonna play. Oh, I'm so sorry, this movie's not gonna play. Um, I'll have to go to the next one. Oh, I'm really sorry about that, but that basically showed the opening motion, but we'll see it here also. Wait, I'm gonna go forward and then I'm gonna go back so you can see the movie. So here's the spike head. And now what you're going to see is the RBD is colored in blue again. Different glycans are colored in pink and dark blue. And you're gonna see this RBD sort of move upward. And basically we're just watching it sort of like start in the closed and then naturally or spontaneously open to that to that open state. And let's watch that just one more time. And so when we looked at these other pat when 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 we using this method, now we can actually start to see what's happening in these functional transitions. And what's cool about that is that one particular glycan, it's N343, which when we looked at just the the closed and the open states, it just looks like a pro. It just looks like a glycan that's shielding in the closed and then um, not shielding in the open state, and you, it doesn't look particularly interesting. But when we actually look at the pathway, we saw that this glycan was acting like a gate. It initially lays on top and helps to shield, and then it does like a hand jive motion, which you can sort of see with these different residues, and it essentially sort of kicks that RBD. Then it lifts it up. You can kind of see it at the end. So we went back to Jason and we said, actually, we have a whole bunch of different hypotheses about like, you know, in interesting residues that are participated in this opening pathway. And um, they tested a whole bunch of the, these uh, mutations now with the hexapro spike construct as the uh, positive control and that uh, disulfide bridged one as the negative control. And you can see the range of different um, mutant responses where pink here is the one highlighting uh, the N343. And we see this actually, this N343 turns out to be even more important than the 165 and the 234 that we had found in the other study that just structurally helps stand it up. It really seems to be playing a role as gating. And so this is, um, this is work that is uh, currently in review. I just want to go back to the other nice thing about this method, and I know I don't, I want to definitely save time for questions, is that we can really investigate these fine grain interactions throughout the whole opening process. You know, so when the when the RBD is in the down state, it's making particular interactions, and we can look at the contact frequency that these residues are making with each other. But over the course of opening, so we go from down to what we call transient to the characterized up state to an even more open state. So we, we, we sample beyond, we go to the up state that they find in cryo-EM, in the initial cryo-EM, and then it keeps going. And it finds 
It finds other experimentally characterized more open states and even beyond on route to sort of the unpeeling that happens. Um, you know, we can see that and then, at, you know, we can sort of monitor the context. So this is all like, you know, it's just very informative and it has a lot of details, but, you know, it gives us a really wonderful understanding of the molecular structure and function uh, of different components of this uh, really important uh, protein. Okay, and then so beyond the spike, as you can imagine, we're interested in a whole bunch of other things, including the ACE2 receptor. So we also have simulations of ACE2. This is ACE2 as a dimer. And one of the interesting things that we found from this simulation is that, you know, when you see the cryo-EM structure, ACE2 is, uh, it's, it's a dimer and it's been, it was structurally resolved with a chaperone. We've removed that chaperone here because that wouldn't be present actually, we don't think in the actual in vivo membrane. Um, but one of the things that we see is that this, this ACE2 flexes tremendously back and forth. It goes almost completely laterally, like it lays down even on the membrane and sort of wags back and forth. And we think that that actually, that movement helps again to facilitate those mechanical interactions that are happening between the spike protein and ACE2 during that fusion process. And so, um, here is uh, just a movie. Actually, you'll see uh, the opening pathway uh, that I meant to show you in the other movie that failed. I'm so sorry. So we have that down confirmation of the RBD. So again, we're looking at the spike head, all the wiggling and jiggling. And using the weighted ensemble, we, we were able to simulate that close to open transition. And you can see it takes a while. We're waiting, we're waiting. There it goes. It opens to the up confirmation. Now we've combined those structures together with the ACE2 in what I call a two parallel membrane system. So now we're looking at the initial infection process from the host across that host cell and viral membrane, which tells us a bunch of interesting things about the context that are being made, of course. But it also has clued us in, as other folks have also shown, to really a lot of, we see a lot of stalk bending and there's certainly a high degree of flexibility in the stalk itself also, which is again, playing some kind of role in this, you know, uh, in this initial infection process, probably just to give it more range as it sort of, um, sort of sticks to ACE2. That, that contact here is amazing. Um, it stays very tight. I mean, that is, that's a, I guess, a nanomolar or picomolar level interaction in some mutations um, and uh, is very tight. And so that sort of stays put while all these other angles um, can hinge and move. And so we're working to characterize, as others have done, this is work that has not yet been published, um, but has been disclosed in uh, a bioarchive uh, preprint. We're characterizing the different sort of angles. They call Gerhard Humer and Martin Beck published some beautiful cryoelectron tomography work um, where they call this the hip of the spike, the knee and the ankle. And they also saw bending. Um, and we see that too. And so, um, you know, we're, we're we're trying again to sort of, uh, we'll continue on to study sort of this sort of amazing process as it goes through fusion. And then um, I just want to also say, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned that one of our big goals was to simulate the whole virus. And we were able to achieve that actually in October of last year, where we took the cryoelectron tomography work and we, um, we, which gave us information about the patterning and the density of the viral spike proteins on the surface. We rebuilt those with atomic resolution and we're able to simulate it. And you can see the sort of the fine grain atomic movements as predicted by the molecular dynamic simulations. This was again, one of the largest um, biophysical simulations that has been achieved. It had over 300 million atoms and was really sort of a tour de force effort um, that was only possible through really an incredible 30 member team. It involved four different supercomputing sites as well as a collaborator in the UK. Um, for this for this work, we were awarded the ACN uh, Gordon Bell Special Prize, which was really um, uh, more of a computing oriented sort of focus and award, but um, was really exciting because it does sort of show uh, these methods, how they can be sort of broadly applicable, not only to this system, but other systems. And so we can sort of um, it's an achievement that, uh, although it's been really focused here on SARS-CoV-2, you know, it, we're going to be sort of reaping the rewards of all of this, uh, these different sort of methodological advances in other fields also, um, which is, I think, exciting. Okay, and then to close, I just want to mention one thing. Um, you know, of course, we're all hearing so much about the different mutations and um, 
you know, these are these, these types of methods can also be quite useful, of course, for modeling, even in advance of when they can uh, characterize experimentally what these mutations might be doing to the structure and function of uh, the spike protein and any other components. Um, and I just want to um, sh showcase this is one last work that was, again, a collaboration with Jason, but also Reno Rapuli in Italy, where they, um, they incubated or lab passaged uh, the virus in a, poly a potent polyclonal sera from patients. And over the course of 90 days, um, generated an escape mutant uh, of the virus that was quite interesting. It recapitulated several of the mutants like the E484K um, that we are seeing in many of the circulating strains and deletions also, you know, in these circulating variant of concerns or mutant strains. But one of the really interesting things to me also in particular was the N-terminal domain, and now we know that the N-terminal domain is part of the, it's one of the key regions of the, you know, antigenic response. This, um, this, this mutant strain actually created an 11 amino acid insertion that encoded a new glycan sequon. And in, in, when we modeled in that glycan, which I'm showing here, so in yellow is the insertion, this loop insertion, and in blue, spheres again is, is, a, is a glycan as we would model it. In gray, I'm showing where, a new, where the neutralizing antibodies would otherwise be binding. You know, by introducing a glycan at this, in, right in the middle of one of the major uh, NTD loops, it basically obliterates the ability of neutralizing antibodies to bind at the NTD. And so, you know, we haven't seen yet, uh, you know, evidence of any of the circulating strains actually, you know, mutating the glycans yet. But you can bet that is something in the repertoire of possibilities, as we saw with this, you know, sort of early work where it's sort of like forced in some sense because of, of the experiment, you know, but over time we'll see that's similar to how we see with influenza and so forth. Okay, and then, all right, in just the last minute, let me just say, what an exciting time to be a scientist, of course, and somebody who's been working in computational virology for a number of years. I mean, this last year has just been really, um, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to see, it's hard to say that anything is really a silver lining because it's been, you know, such a devastating uh, period of time, like for the whole world. Um, but I have been, uh, you know, heartened in some sense at the response of the scientific community. I think science really, uh, scientists have really done an exceptional job sort of trying to respond. And, you know, we realized early on, you know, in March even, that we needed to do something differently to really address SARS-CoV-2. You know, ordinarily scientists, we, we hold our cards very close to our chest and we're very secretive, you know, because in large part, to be honest, because the, the reward system is really geared towards that. You know, you wanna be first and uh, that's very important. Um, and so, but we knew we couldn't do that. And we knew we had to just share more. And so, you know, we, the molecular simulation community really early on, banded together and drafted a set of community principles that over 200 groups around the world sort of agreed to, to share our methods, our structures, our data sets in advance of publication um, and, and with use of preprint servers. It actually led to the development of a wonderful repository for simulations as sort of related structures, um, which is gonna be a tremendous, it's already been a tremendous resource, but going forward together with advances in AI, I think is gonna be really a treasure. Uh, for scientists. And then I also want to shout out to the NIH for, um, you know, and other agencies for their support of community software, open community software, such that any scientist in, in anywhere could, could take the structures deposited by these fantastic scientists, or, you know, and other data sets, sequences, et cetera, and actually do things with them. So NAMD and VMD certainly have benefited from over, I think about 30 years of P41 development at the NIH and it's just, it was really important uh, on that aspect. And then finally also, um, you know, they, the other sort of really game changer for folks in our field was the development of the COVID-19 High Performance Compute Consortium, where, all the people literally in the world who had big computes, you had Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, all of the NIA, you know, the, the NSF computers, NIH doesn't have any, you know, for various reasons, um, or that, you know, it's a different, the infrastructure has sort of been separated historically. Um, DOE, DOD, they, they made their, uh, the compute time available. 
And so just one last comparison, you know, for the flu, when we wanted to simulate the big flu uh, virus, we had to put in a proposal, you know, that was viewed. It took us about two to three years to get the compute time, to maybe two and a half years to get the compute time. For SARS-CoV-2, we got it in basically a week. So that was, you know, these types of uh, rapid mobilization of resources, I think was also really key. And it took a community. So I think that's something that the scientific community, you know, has a lot to be proud of. Okay, with that, I would love to take questions. There is so much to discuss. Um, I'm also happy to talk about this method, these methods being applied to, you know, other proteins, which are, of course, there's so many now. I think it's a really exciting time for, for science in the field. Um, but I should absolutely thank all of the collaborators and folks around the world who helped to, um, you know, study, who participated in, in the work that I talked about. Alisa Fada, as, as I mentioned, she's this amazing glycoscientist at Maynooth University in Dublin. She's uh, just fantastic. Lorenzo Castellino, <clears throat> Ziad Gaev, and Abigail Dahmer also just didn't sleep for like six months, which, you know, is definitely not advisable. We were all just sort of caught up in everything. Um, Rita Rawi at the NIH Vaccine uh, Center, also really fantastic conversations and so many others around the world. And also, of course, um, thanks to uh, GM actually for helping us, letting us pivot some of our effort, on our GM award to study this and also the compute resources. So with that, I hope I didn't go too long and I hope we have time for questions. If you have any, I'd love to talk. Thank you, Dr. Amaro. This was a very fascinating talk and we certainly have some time for questions and uh, I wanna encourage everyone to uh, submit your questions into the chat box so we can um, read it. And you already have a few of those. Uh, so uh, Hannah Golding is asking if you modeled the D14G uh, mutant that's supposed to favor the up RBT confirmation. We, so um, as you can imagine, there are so many variants to model. And so we do have to be a little bit choosy, but the D614G uh, is one that um, we have, we do have simulations of now. We haven't actually published those yet, but they are complete. And so, yeah, we have that one. We have the UK strain, we have the South Africa strain, and we have some other interesting mutations that different collaborators are interested in. And so we're kind of in the throes of analyzing those. And there have been some other groups that have, I think, already published a little bit on how um, sort of that these mutations, even when they're sort of far from like the RBD, they actually can affect sort of the global dynamics of the spike. And I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done there. Interesting. And there's another question from Nissan uh, Batakadia. Um, whether the glycan-free exposed residues can be used when designing more effective neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And I, I think uh, I have a question related to that uh, about small molecules, if, if uh, uh, you looked into that. Right, so um, I think in general, the thinking is that the, 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 the parts of the surface of the spike that are exposed would be, um, that are directly exposed would be the easiest to, or easiest, you know, or most recognizable probably for um, for things like neutralizing antibodies. Also in terms of targeting for, uh, with small molecules, generally I think people are thinking those would be the sites to go after. Um, but it is important also to recognize, I mean like, so I showed those pictures, what I call like the composite picture of the glycan shield where I'm showing all of the positions mm -hmm. over the like microsecond of dynamics, because if, if another molecule is approaching from kind of far away, that's essentially what they see. They're gonna see this fine scale, like blurring kind of motion. But as something gets really close, you know, the, these glycans do adopt particular conformations. And so it's not totally accurate to say, especially for a small molecule that it wouldn't be able to access into those otherwise heavily shielded sites, but it's more difficult. So I think in general, people are trying to go for more of the exposed areas. Great, so there are uh, many more questions popping up. Um, uh, so yeah, there is a, a, a first question from Robert Bass. I believe that you answered this question. Is there density in the cryo-EM structures for the glycans that could be compared with your models retrospectively? That's a great question. Um, so, and there are, you know, there's so much method. Well, there, there is a bit, and there's a lot. You can say there's so much. I mean, there's a lot of method development happening right now in cryo-EM. 
um, which is good. And, you know, initially Jason was really excited to get our models with the glycans to see if using at least one of these programs that they could actually, if it would help them resolve some of the density, but it wasn't quite good enough at the time, but that was a long time ago. And I, you know, since then, you know, there's been so many groups working on it. So I would hope, I think that it should be that you could with methods do that, but again, maybe it's just, they are really quite flexible. So perhaps it just comes down to, you know, how many images are actually capturing and we're gonna be limited in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so Valerie Darcy uh, is uh, saying that uh, your talk was amazing. Um, uh, she's asking, does the RBD along with the glycan gate uh, door prop open and close spontaneously with the hope of bumping into AC2? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's a great question. Oh, that's one of the questions that I really want to know the answer to. You know, <laughs> is, um, well, I mean, I think so that work by, um, I'm going to say his name wrong, wrong but Walter Mathis was the senior PI. They have this real-time fret, you know, showed that it, it does seem to open and close on the second time scale. I, there, but there are a lot of intriguing studies coming out about the potential role of host cell proteoglycans, glycosamine glycans and heparin sulfates that you know are part of the cellular surface that would be long, much longer than an ACE2 and the first point of contact probably with those spikes. There's a lot of places where um, there's a number of studies and preprints indicating that those guys are binding and it's hard to, I mean, I don't know if it's just like a localization thing or is it possible that those sugar like molecules when they bind to the spike are actually somehow helping to induce or otherwise stabilize the RBD in that exposed confirmation? I mean, I think that's something that's still TBD but is a really interesting question. It's fascinating. Uh, we can have one more question and we will have to move on. Um, uh, 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 like, uh, George uh, Turillo uh, is asking, is the same model could reveal more about the structure of uh, immune cells? Uh, the same like type of modeling? I think so. I think we are just scratching the surface. We, I know we're just scratching the surface with what we can do with these types of methods. Um, I can imagine that that's even more, much more complex than the virus, right? Well, it is, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I talk with immunologists, it's just like, oh my gosh, alphabet soup land. Um, no, but there's so, there's, there really truly is that, that is definitely like an emerging frontier. And I think, you know, with all the new different methods and data types. Um, I think it's a very exciting one. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, again Dr. Amaro for, for your amazing talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will move to uh, the closing remarks that will be delivered uh, by the scientific director of NIDDK, Dr. Uh, Mike Krauss. Thank you.